Thank you very much, Andy. Um, this session has got such an enormous and terrifying title that I'm going to start by narrowing down what I'm going to talk about in order to fit into the general rubric. So I'm going to focus on the governance of emergent technologies. And uh, I should say to start with that I use emergent in a very broad sense there. Emergent might mean new, completely novel technologies. It might mean technologies on the threshold of a major expansion. It might mean quite old technologies deployed in new contexts, sometimes quite scarily new contexts like geoengineering. Or it might mean technologies that I think Brian Wynne has referred to as sort of endlessly emergent because they never settle down to being fully publicly acceptable. And it's interesting in that context that Sellafield is once again in the news this week. And I would say that nuclear power and nuclear waste disposal are, in that sense, endlessly emergent technologies. So just to narrow down the title, that's the field that I'm going to look at. It's an area that I've done various bits of work on. I'm also going to make as an entry point to my remarks, the Royal Commission on Environmental Pollution, which several people referred to yesterday as the late lamented Royal Commission. For those of you who don't know, it was one of Britain's longest standing environmental advisory bodies. It was uh, created under Harold Wilson's government in 1970, a time of great upheaval, environmental revolution, if you like. And um, it gave advice to governments and others over a period of 41 years and 33 reports. So it's quite a nice long time series. Uh, and I think I've actually done quite a lot of work on this body as well as having been a member of it for 10 years. That over that time, through its various reports and its other practices and activities, the Royal Commission actually made quite a substantial contribution to the opening up of environmental policy communities, both to different perspectives and to much greater environmental scrutiny. And some of its reports, they weren't called it at the time, but a number of its important reports were probably what we might think of in the broadest sense of the word, technology assessments. The Commission looked at emerging technologies and asked about the environmental and sometimes the wider social, political and ethical issues associated with those technologies. So let me start with a quote from one of its seminal reports, its report on nuclear power in 1976. If anyone hasn't read it, do. Um, and I reread it recently after a long period. It is still the most powerful document. I think it is a, a remarkable report. And it was written at a time when there was what could only be described as a Promethean narrative of nuclear expansion. The, in, the plans for expansion of nuclear power were truly <coughs> astonishing. And the Commission, in its rather sober way, sat down and looked at this and sort of started to think about the implications. The report is best remembered for what then became the Flowers Criterion. There should be no expansion, major expansion of civil nuclear power unless and until there was at least a plausible solution to the problem of nuclear waste. So it is indeed ironic that Sellafield is in the news again this week uh, for that very reason. But the other thing the Commission did in this report, which is very interesting, it actually endorsed a number of calls that were emergent in the 1970s for, and I quote, the most searching examination of major technological developments at the stage when these are conceived and before any commitment to them is made. Did that on paragraph 163 of its report. About 40 years later, and a little, just a few years before its demise, the Commission did another report which could be called a technology assessment. It looked at the environmental implications of the very rapid development of nanotechnologies and you know, what are the human health and environmental possible impacts and implications of these technologies. 
Uh, I was actually on the commission then. One of the witnesses described trying to do environmental and health warnings about nanotechnologies as like trying to shout a message at the driver of an express train as it rushes past. And in the nano report, it, uh, the Royal Commission <coughs> argued again that the governance of emergent technology should involve a pluralistic process, and I quote, grounded in reflective and informed technical and social intelligence. Those two quotes, 40-something years apart, tell us two things about the governance of emergent technologies. So this is, in a sense, my first message. The quest for good governance of techno-scientific innovations is nothing new. It's been going on for nearly half a century, probably longer. But the other part of the message is that, in my view, the goal remains extremely elusive, despite a huge amount of argumentation and activity. So that's, as it were, the broad context. What's also interesting about those two particular reports from the Royal Commission, the Nuclear Report and the Nano Report, is that they presented different models of opening up of these debates about the technologies concerned. In the nuclear report, the Commission's emphasis was a little old-fashioned. It talked a lot about public understanding, public education. <laughs> it uh, said there was a need wasn't particularly anti-nuclear, but it said that even if the nuclear industry claimed that the developments were safe, they had to be demonstrated to be safe to assuage public fears. So it was very clear that you needed public demonstration of safety, not just, you know, not just repeated assurances from an industry with a vested interest. And in a sense, its own interpretation of the searching examination of this emergent technology that it was looking for was um, something that one might describe as deliberation in public rather than public deliberation. And the two are clearly rather different things. By the time it came to the Nano Report, however, in 2008, it was arguing that the challenge for society in dealing with emergent technologies which are ubiquitous, you know, happening all over the world at a, at a very rapid pace, the challenge, according to the, the Commission, was to find the means through which civil society can engage with the social, political and ethical dimensions of science-based technologies and democratise their licence to operate. So that was a rather different take on opening up. It called then for an open and adaptive system of governance grounded in reflective and informed technical and social intelligence, as I've mentioned. Second message then is that on those two models of opening up, you know, whether it's deliberation in public or whether it's some much wider gathering of social intelligence, there are deep differences still, and over the half century of debate in between, a huge proliferation of understandings, uh, uh, of misunderstandings, sorry, about what might be involved in those models of opening up. So that takes me then to three dilemmas, which I think of been woven through these misunderstandings over a long period. And I compose them, in a sense, in, in the form of three questions, but they're much more than questions. So the first question is, opening up to whom? Are we opening up to wider publics, which is often the interpretation that opening up has, uh, uh, is often the way in which it's been interpreted? And of course, there's a lot of literature and debate about 
the publicness of public engagement, and whether it's really public or not. That's not what I want to talk about here. I just want to ask this question, to whom are we opening up? Why do publics, as Brian Wynne and others have argued, the right to have a say in decisions and strategies that affect their lives can be seen as the right of every democratic citizen. Or as Frank Fisher puts it, it's the normative core of democracy to think of having a say in these key developments. Or are we talking about opening up to civil society associations and organisations? This is more what actually happens in practice, it seems to me, than opening up to wider publics, maybe valuable in itself. If you like, that's the pluralist perspective on opening up. People have used the term stakeholders. I think that does have a rather different meaning from civil society, but it's that sort of sense of collectivities that we're opening up to. Or is there a third sense in which we talk about opening up, where we're actually trying to open up to different sorts of communities, possibly known as epistemic communities or even discourse coalitions? Lots of terminology might be employed. But the interesting thing that we're trying to do there is open up to very different worldviews about the matter in hand. Different perspectives, different worldviews about the pros and cons of particular techno-scientific interventions in society. And what is very important then is that those worldviews cut across many of our comfortable dichotomies, our comfortable familiar dichotomies. They cut across the so-called expert lay divide. They cut across the rights of individual citizens as opposed to stakeholders or other kinds of pluralities. They cut across and hybridize science and politics. And this is why I think we get into such a muddle when we talk about things like GM, because I think we've often fallen into the trap of to, I, did, I promised David Spiegelhardt actually I wouldn't use the term we. I don't like the term we, so I apologise, David. We is a very unclear term. Um, is it we, scientific community, we as a society, we as a government, we as, you know, the people in this room? It's always ambiguous but much used, so I'll try not to. Um, but the point that I'm sort of trying to make is that opening up to encompass completely different world views about both the benefits <coughs> and the potential downsides of emergent technologies is incredibly important. And the danger of conflating the different kinds of engagement under one umbrella term, public engagement, seems to me to be something of a trap that much of the discourse about these issues has fallen into over the last decade or so. Second question, opening up to engage with what? What's the question that's to be engaged with? Um, and I would suggest that in the context of emerging, emerging technologies, and many people have made this point, um, the engagement is not to be just with the risks or the consequences of those technologies narrowly defined. I think many people's uneasiness about emergent technologies is not only or not even about the risks narrowly defined. It's about something much bigger. As the Royal Commission put it in its nano report, it wasn't a nano report, by the way. It was absolutely huge, but um, <laughs> you know, I use the shorthand. Um, that, that the governance of emerging technologies, emergent technologies, should look beyond risk to encompass questions about the direction 
application and control of the technologies concerned. In other words, um, the questions to be asked are often, or the questions that are being asked, but sometimes being asked, as it were, by uninvited participants, <coughs> as uh, various colleagues have described them, uh, are really concerned with the relations between techno-scientific phenomena and society. Those are the questions that are the deeply troubling ones, that are sometimes um, articulated or represented as fears about, I don't know, something really, yes, yeah, still of concern, but nowhere near as broad as that. Uh, or, um, and therefore, seen in that light, a meaningful engagement must involve, as Brian again has put it, a space for the negotiation of public meaning involved with those technologies and their societal uh, effects. And that relates to the third question, and I haven't got much more to say, Andy. Um, the question of, therefore, when does one open up? And I know there's been a good deal of debate about upstream and downstream engagement and so on. Yes, of course, you know, one wants to open up early on in the process. Perhaps, you know, <laughs> what also needs to be said is that the opening up needs to be at the stage of the framing of the questions to be asked about the emergent technology. And that, in turn, makes it a nonsense to talk about having a technical phase of assessment first and that followed by a phase of so-called public engagement, by which time the tacit framings in the technical and scientific phase have put boundaries round the questions that can be asked about the technology uh, that is being discussed. And indeed, in some ways, one can argue that to try to say that we'll have a technical and scientific assessment and then after that we'll look at the politics, the ethics, the public fears and so on. That is actually technocracy in action and it's to be avoided at all costs. Okay, so message three then is that this issue of, about the desirability or even the possibility of separating the technical from the political in our discourses on emergent technologies is one of the deepest divisions that I think you can find in communities that now discuss these issues, where there are people of goodwill and intelligence on both sides of that argument. This is nothing to do with an expert lay public divide. It's something massively more profound. Okay, final point then. Those were the three issues that flowed, but there is a fourth. And that's the question that I don't know any answer to. How do we do it? And uh, I think that in the end, you know, what Robert Dahl, a political scientist, called the inexorable consequences of time and numbers makes it almost impossible to assess emergent technologies on a case-by-case -case basis. As somebody said yesterday, quoting Oscar Wilde, it just takes up too many evenings. It can't be done. And so the question is then, how do we do it? And I don't know the answer. Um, the Royal Commission in the NANA report suggested one, not exactly a way forward, but a philosophy, perhaps worth thinking about, that instead of relentlessly striving to work from every individual technology through to its implications, and on NANO alone there are tens of thousands of them, um, Instead of starting at that end, one might invert the whole thing and begin with questions of principle. And so to quote, final quote from that report, a key task would be to consider which kinds of interventions in the human and non-human worlds controlled by whom might be deemed acceptable or problematic and why. Uh, and I think the final 
message then, I suppose, is if you think of it like that, then the incredible ongoing struggle that we have to reinvent, sustain, and develop ways in which we can have effective opening up and engagement, I don't think we've found a way of keeping it going, sustaining it, making it normal, making it work. That, I think, tells us something about the power part of your um, very complicated session title. And I'll stop <laughs> there. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs>